53 degrees. Good evening and welcome to GBN Live. I'm Mike Hickson. So glad to be with you tonight. We hope that you will stay with us for the next hour as we discuss the subject, when does humor cross the line into the profane? And I think this is a great subject. And gentlemen, we're glad to be together tonight to study this great topic. And I guess as we begin and as we think about humor, first and foremost, to let people know that we do believe in and appreciate humor. I think the Lord wants us to be happy and to enjoy life. And I think about the words of Solomon, a merry heart does good like medicine. And so to be able to laugh and to enjoy life, uh, I think is uh, it's a great thing. We do want to invite you to please give us a call tonight. You can reach us at 888-805-3390. Feel free to email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. We would be happy to take your questions and comments tonight as we study together when does humor cross the line into the profane. Let's begin by first of all talking about the importance of governing our speech, our tongue. I think sometimes that we tend to categorize sin. And it may be the case that, that, that we step across certain boundaries without even knowing it. And, and the words of James in chapter 2 when he said, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, which says to me that not only will our actions, not only will we be held accountable for our actions, but also for our words. And, and so do you think people... In, in the church, and even some out of the church, do you think that we give enough consideration to our speech? I don't think so. I think a lot of times, and just like you were, you were stating, along with our actions, you know, our words, uh, we, we have to keep them in check, just as we do our actions, because they can go too far, uh, whether it be humor, whether it be involved in humor, or whether it be even in uh, just conversation with someone. We have to be concerned about those with whom we're talking, and uh, as, as well as the actual words that we use, because we'll be judged by all of that. Yes, so. absolutely. Uh, Matt, as you as you think about the implications of our study tonight, and and I, I think that all of us have a deep appreciation for humor, and sometimes maybe it's because we want attention, maybe there are other reasons, but but there are times when maybe we're not as careful as we should be, and so are there some tips that would help us make sure that we don't cross that line? Well, I think just in the opening of what you discussed, you tied a couple things together that are very important to look at together, which is, yes, it's good to have humor. It's good to have a sense of humor and to have fun. But then the passage you bring from James about being judged by the law of liberty. There's much liberty in Christ, and we ought to enjoy that liberty. But the fact of the matter is that even the law of liberty obviously has its limitations because you'll be judged by it. So if I'm thinking about tips, then one of the most important ones is this. Um, I have to continue to do what, again, James told me to do in James chapter 1. And I have to continue to consider the scriptures as a mirror and look into that mirror and check myself. And, and I was speaking with uh, Wayne just before the show and said, you know, there's actually one part of my personality that I've been curtailing recently because I was realizing people, I would tell jokes and I have a very dry sense of humor sometimes and people were not realizing I was joking and I said, yeah. you know, I'm going to have to switch my speech up to make sure I say I'm just joking when I say a joke because people would hear me be dry. So I think a big part of it is just recognizing um, when I speak, think about it and consider what effect it has on the people around me and how it lines up with God's Word. Absolutely. And, and you know, as we talk about the book of James, I've often said that the book of James is one of the most practical books in Scripture. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament counterpart would be Proverbs. And, and if you look at the emphasis that James really places on the tongue, for example, in chapter 1, verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, he said this one's religion is useless or vain. In chapter 3, he spends a considerable amount of time talking about the importance of keeping the tongue in check. And he talks about how a little member boasts great things. And you think about how much trouble we can get into with our tongue if, if we don't exercise caution. 
Absolutely. I think that uh, when it comes to uh, you know, humor and, and telling jokes and, and our words in general, you know, they're attached to our personalities. And so, much like we all have different personalities, you know, our speech patterns are different. The way that we talk and carry ourselves is often sure. different as well. And sometimes our humor is, is often different. And so, sometimes it's the case that our humor might be different because, like you said a moment ago, we're trying to maybe get attention by telling a joke. Um, or it may be the case that, um, you know, just a natural thing happened and it was funny, you know. And so, there's a, there's a difference in that. And so... Uh, in each of those situations, you have to, to look as well and consider those with whom you are with. And because it may be funny to you, but it may be not funny to the individual that you're sitting across from. And, and you need to be considerate of that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5, Paul said in verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. And, and we understand uh, the problems associated with fornication, uh, living an unclean life, uh, demonstrating greediness or covetousness in life. But then he lumps into this passage of Scripture such things as filthiness, foolish talking, and coarse jesting. And then he goes on to say which I think is extremely important, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Again, this idea of, of recognizing who we are, whose we are, and the fact that Christian deportment or behavior is a must. And so what about, what about this idea of filthiness? What, what's, what, what's Paul talking about here? Well, if you look in Ephesians 4 and 5, the, the general context in which this scripture takes place is the Ephesians are evidently struggling with this problem of, um, of purity and of conducting themselves in this way. You get into this concept of filthiness, and he has several things. I mean, it progresses as he talks here, but when he talks about... Um, this, this filthiness, um, the, the word being referenced here is uh, that which is foul talking. It's, 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 it's a speech that is coarse and brutal. And it's interesting, if you go through, several commentators will point out that the word for filthiness here does not necessarily have to be speech. And uh, I think anybody who has been around someone who is behaving filthily can understand that. Sometimes somebody doesn't have to say a word, right. but they can convey a thought by a filthy um, action. A gesture. A gesture, uh, uh, even a certain look that they give and, 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 and it click carries with it a clear indication of what they're thinking and they can carry across something that is it's, it's filthy, it's, it's, it's disgusting. It's the reason that I don't go to a garbage can when I'm, when, when I'm looking for something uh, clean and, and, and delicious to eat. It's not the right place to be, it's filthy. That's right, so he talks about filthiness and then foolish talking. What, what would that, what would that uh, mean based on what Paul is saying here? Strong used an interesting word to, to express uh, what this means, buffoonery or yeah. silly talking. Uh, one writer, uh, as a matter of fact, one writer did say that. Yeah, and and so you have the idea of this, this, this silly talking. So you go from that which is obscene and shameful uh, with the idea of filthiness. You connect to that the idea of, of just a general silliness that, is, that has no real edification involved in it, has no... Uh, uh, you know, no, nothing good for anybody. Buffoonery tells us that it's taking it to a place that is that is even far reaching than that. And it could be it could be an act that somebody's putting on. You know, um, some might say that you know even slapstick comedy might fall into yeah. you know buffoonery into, into that kind of uh, action. And so, is is that the kind of thing that a Christian needs to be involved in? You know, when when you connect it with these things, lasciviousness and other things mentioned there, then filthiness, that which is either by gesture or talk that which is obscene and shameful, and then silliness that might be connected to that as well. You know, one writer used the words empty-headed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I can't help but think about people who get out and get tanked up on alcohol. And many of us have seen individuals who are intoxicated, and, and some of the things that they will say are so foolish. And I've often wondered if people could only see themselves as they really are when they're when they when they're drunk. Uh, 
they, they, they act foolish. I think that's what Paul is talking about to some extent. Well, and I think, too, you have, you, you've seen people, uh, sometimes just the shocked look on our face sometimes tells the tale. Somebody will say something and you go, I can't believe they just said that. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was, without thinking, something that was just blurted out, you know, and, and so uh, and that, you know that, to me, would fall into that realm, that kind of... You know, the contrast, uh, based on what you're saying, in Proverbs 31, the Bible talks about the word worthy woman and the wonderful attributes that she demonstrates and one of those attributes he said she opens her mouth in wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness and I think about somebody who is very careful they, they think before they speak. Peter's a great example of somebody who often blurted out things, but never, you know, he failed to really get his mind into gear before his mouth. And as a result of that, he paid a heavy price at times. Yeah. What about coarse jesting? Yeah, yeah, that's what I, I have a thought here. You, you go filthiness, foolish talking, we end up here, of course, jesting. And what it seems is that you almost have like a broad to narrow here in the sense of when you start with filthiness, it's filthy, yes, but it could be a gesture, it could be anything. You get down to this concept of what we discussed of, of foolish talking, the, the, the words of a fool and the way the Bible refers to a fool. But when you get to this concept of, course, jesting, this jesting, um, everything I've read on this, it's interesting that these words aren't used. Uh, a lot of times you'll do a word study on something. These words, several of these words in this verse are, are unique to this passage in the Bible. And in fact, um, this word jesting, excuse me, now the foolish talking is, it's in Aristotle, but even there it's rarely used, in, in, even in classical Greek. So when we understand these things, we have to understand them simply from their definition. And this idea of jesting gives an idea of almost like a fencer. This is the, the, the filthy man or the foolish talking man is the buffoon, like we talked about, it's the, it's the just out of place. This man, this concept of jesting would be a skillful use. This is that person who, they, they're not a person. They know how to person. turn a phrase. They're yeah. turning that phrase and they're doing it in a way that's inappropriate. That's right. And, and you know, sometimes I think individuals will say something, but, but there is an underlying meaning that they're trying to convey. Right. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I think sitcoms do this sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, they'll, they'll say something, but underneath they're, they're trying to convey something that's, that's really uh, uh, dirty. The master yeah. of this, the master of jesting, if you want to, uh, to understand what it is, is William Shakespeare. And people don't often understand. I was, a, I was an English major in college. I acted in Shakespeare plays. Um, Shakespeare was a perverse man, but he was n not very often was he was he uh, foolish. Enough. He would turn something. He would I insert something that had was clever, but had a sexual connotation behind it. And uh, and in fact, much of Shakespeare is, is inappropriate, but it's done cleverly. Well, you know what? You know, you know I, I think that's one of the things that that writers in television do, and that is they they portray a lot of sexual innuendo through some of the varying scenes or whatnot. And so, uh, I mean, they're very clever at what they do. Uh, I've got a question that's come in. What about sharing a post on Facebook, cuss words that someone else said, like in politi political postings? Where is the limit? Obviously, if it has cussing in it, it has no place uh, in the public, uh, whether Christian or not. But, but certainly, uh, as Christians, we have responsibility to make sure that we're, you know, that's that's not a part of our life. Which is what Ephesians chapter four and five. That's what we've been talking about. That's what it's really about. It's walking in love as Christ has loved us. And that whole passage is talking about how we walk, how we live our daily lives, and then to include in that conversation that we have. And Facebook is just a uh, a way that we have a conversation. Another way that we have a conversation, so it's just a, a social way of doing that. Uh, I, I'd like to, to go back to the, the course jesting for just a moment, and, and I think the, the point that, that was made is, is excellent. You know, a word that um, we often use is wit. And that's the idea, it's, and it's that knowledge, and sometimes we talk about folks that are quick-witted. Yep. Well, again, this is, this is the idea of, of having a knowledge and a wisdom of how to, how to turn that phrase, but a wit that is one that is involved in, in vulgarity. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, and, and so one writer even and called it low jesting. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it has to do with humor, but it's the way that humor is used in order to bring or add to something that is vulgar. And 
and, and I would add the idea too that you know comedians today and, and I would go back even this kind of ties into the, the Facebook question you know comedians today a lot of them hide themselves under the guise of, well we're just being funny and so we can say anything as long as it's there are people laughing then we can say pretty much anything well that's not the case right. uh, truly it, it's it's not and, and that's what we read in these passages uh, we, we can have good humor and it and it helps us to learn to smile it helps our countenance sure. it helps our hearts it helps us feel better in that way whereas this low jesting this coarse humor that's crude and and, and cruel to, to many people offensive in many ways uh, is has no place in the Christian life well, and, and you know I think going back to to what Matt said in addition to to your comments there you know if you look at the book of Ephesians, uh, the book of Ephesians Paul is writing to Christians right and and he, he contrasts the old man with the new man and and as you said a moment ago I think that what we need to understand is that as Christians particularly people who are coming out of the world sometimes they bring baggage with them from the world and it's very difficult sometimes to cut bait or cut ties to the world and so if we're not careful we can bring those things into the Christian life and as a result of that our conduct is not what it ought to be and I think about what Paul said to Timothy in 1st Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 let no one despise your youth but be an example of the believers in word mm -hmm. in conduct and you know Paul here and, and, and the seriousness about what we're discussing tonight listen to this in the same context for this you know that no fornicator unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God and then he goes on to say let no one deceive you with empty or vain words for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience so what he's saying there if I understand what if I understand it correctly is it can cost us our soul yeah absolutely and verse 7 if you add that to it he's do not be partakers with them that's right you know that's obviously right. this is something that he He's, he's comparing to those around them, those who are outside the body of Christ, those who were coming into the body of Christ. They were having difficulty uh, stepping out of that old man and his ways and putting on that new man and living a new life in Christ. And, and so Paul is, is very much dealing with that. And he says, if you continue that way with them, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you look at verse 8, he said, you were once darkness. Yeah. But now he said, you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And, yeah. of course, Jesus was the light of the world. And we're to follow in his footsteps. And so what we're talking about from a practical standpoint can be a problem in the lives of many people. I think so. And, and I think sometimes as Christians, and, and, and you know, again, sometimes we tend to categorize sin, and when it comes to the tongue, we say, well, you know, that's really not that big a deal. But I think what Paul is saying is it is a big deal. Well, Jesus said it was a big deal because our Lord tells us in, in, in multiple accounts that... Um, that the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. So it's interesting. When we do these things in Ephesians, when we say these things in, in, in the latter part of Ephesians 4 that we've outlined here in Ephesians 5, it's not just that the action itself is sinful. It is. But it also speaks to the fact that before you spoke it, your heart was in the wrong place. You were already, you were already in the wrong place with God because because of the um, the place that your heart was in order to say the thing. Okay, so based on what Jesus said in Matthew chapter twelve, Jesus talks about the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. The evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And and to put it in our vernacular today, garbage in, garbage out. Wholesome things in, wholesome things out. So wouldn't that say something about how careful we ought to be with regard to what we listen to, what we watch, the people with whom we interact? Yeah, and that's part of the thing we talk about, not taking account of ourselves, not thinking about it enough. And for an example, I brought you something for tonight. We normally give us waters, but I brought you some water <laughs> to drink. Thanks. That's for you. And um, I don't want you to pass. I want you to drink that. Um, you 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 look at that water, and it's obvious when you look at that water that that water is disgusting. It's got grass floating in it. It's got dirt settling now. It. We get that. Here's what I want you to believe. I, I will accept it because you can tell me, you can point it out and show me that that's dirty. But I want you to turn around and accept this fact. Yes, that's dirty, but it came from a pure source. 
that's what we do with this with this kind of coarse jesting. That's what we do with this kind of, of filthy talk. Is even in the moment that we identify that it's dirty, we pretend it came from a pure source. I spoke wickedness out of a pure heart. And the fact of the matter is, if there's any pattern at all to my wickedness, it's not out of a pure heart. You know, well, great points, great points. And I think since we're in Matthew chapter 12 with regard to the severity of what we're discussing tonight, listen to what Jesus said. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So the Lord holds us accountable for everything that we say. And I think sometimes, you know, the word idle here, the, the idea of careless. And I think sometimes that's what happens. We are careless with, with our speech when it comes to telling jokes or, uh, you know, sometimes. Uh, and, we, and we want to talk a little bit about locker room talk as well. Because I think sometimes people say, well, you know, it's just a bunch of guys and we're all together. So what does, what does the Lord think about that? We're going to take a break. We'll be right back in a couple of minutes. Hope you'll stay with us. I'm sitting down with John King with the Churches of Christ Disaster Response Team. John, tell us a little bit about DRT. Well, DRT is a response organization that, that goes in and assists uh, people and churches during a disaster. Typically what we do is we uh, try to find a host church in the area and we try to support them as they support their community. Uh, typically what we do is we supply manpower, uh, volunteers come in and, and then we house them and we uh, support as we go through that. Uh, we have some uh, equipment that we bring in with that. We have heavy equipment. We have uh, tool trailers. We have the uh, shower trailer. Of course, everybody needs a shower during that. And uh, then we have a, a mobile kitchen. So we, we can pretty much work independent uh, with trying to support that church. So if somebody's in a disaster zone or wants to help folks in a disaster zone, DRT is the place to go? Uh, that's true. And you can reach out to us. Well, we have a website you can go look at. And we also have a Facebook page. If you want to get connected, you know, sign up for email. And uh, we'll send you emails when we're doing something. Fantastic. Thanks so much for being with us, John. Still thy goodness prove While the hope of endless glory Fills my heart with joy and love Thank you for tuning in to GBN Live. If you have a question related to tonight's topic that you would like to have answered, please call 888 888- 805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. You can also email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us live each week. You can send your questions through Facebook in the comments section and we will do our best to get them answered on the air. Now back to the program. Thank you for staying with us. We hope that you will continue with us for the duration of our program tonight as we discuss when does humor cross the line into the profane. We had an email question earlier by Curtis, and he referenced uh, social media, Facebook. And one of the thought, one of the thoughts that I had, and I want to go back to it for just a moment or two, and that is, I think if we're not careful, we can use social media in a very non-productive, unchristian way. And I think sometimes if we're not careful, I, I personally do not engage in Facebook and some of the other things, but, but I do know that it can be problematic. And, and sometimes we take sayings out of the world and use them on our own posts. For example, OMG. Mm-hmm. And think nothing of it. And I know sometimes people will do that multiple times in a post, never giving thought that uh, they're taking the Lord's name in vain. So what, what, what type of uh, rules do you think we ought to consider with regard to, quote-unquote, social media? 
That's a good one for Wayne. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think that when it comes to social media, and, and, and I use social media, different different platforms of it, and I think you, you do have to be careful. I think you also, uh, with regards to uh, also even helping young people to, uh, to, to better navigate through the waters of, of social media, and, and they are rather deep waters because it can go, uh, it can be used for good, obviously it can be used for bad, so you try to, you try to trade in a way that, that will, will show others that way, and that's, that's why I've uh, been on it before. I thought, well, if I could be a good example and show someone you know, how it can be yeah. used in a good way, uh, then that's good. Not to say that I've always done it perfectly or anything like that. I, I think that we, uh, we have to always keep ourselves in check the same way you know, with our words. And because this is an outlet, social media is an outlet of our speech, uh, if we just simply repost something that someone else has, has put out there without looking at it and, and taking into consideration and asking those same questions, is this something I would speak? Yeah. Is this something that I would say uh, in conversation sitting right here with the three of us? Would, it, would we have this conversation? Would I use this type of language and, and make that kind of statement? Would I, would I do it in a public setting in, in front of 100 people, 1,000 people? What, I think you need to put it out there in that way. Would I use this kind of language? Well, what it, well it's just a meme. It's just a picture. Well, if a picture has words on it or if a picture itself is vulgar, yeah. like we were talking about a moment ago, if it's a, it would be like a gesture. It would be the same, the same type of thing. You know, so um, I, I think there again, you have to consider and you have to look within. Are these words that I would speak? Uh, you know, and, and and want to be judged by. As would would it be wrong to ask the question, "What would Jesus say?" I don't think so. You know, the, the old phrase, what would Jesus do? But what yeah. would he say? Yeah. You know, if he has left us an example to follow in his steps, as Peter said, then, you, you know, that might be a good question to ask before we post something. Sure. Would, would the Lord do that? Uh, you mentioned the fact that you try to use it for good, and I think a lot of people do, and I'm grateful for that. But I think sometimes, if we're not careful, we get down in the gutter with the world. Right. And before you know it, we're wallowing in the mire with the world. Right. And, and and that's an important distinction that too is that works for you if you know the Lord according to the scriptures. There are those in society today, if you say that question, what would Jesus say? Or would Jesus laugh at this? And but there's those in the world today who now they they kind of gotten in the gutter a little bit and they've tried to bring Jesus down to them. So it's also to remember that he is he is holy. Right. He's holy. He uh, is set apart and he set us apart and made That's us right. holy if we truly know him. And so it's got to be with a reverence of who he is and with a reverence of who he is. And I don't get the whole thing where the guys are wearing the t-shirts uh, that have irreverent phrases about Jesus on them and trying to bring him down and make him base. No, he's a holy God. And how would he feel about this? You know, you know, the Hebrew writer, you just touched the nerve. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 7 that Jesus is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, which suggests, as you said a moment ago, his holiness. And Peter would say that we are to be holy as he is holy. We've been sanctified, set apart. And, and I think sometimes maybe we, we forget that, uh, sadly. Other questions come in. What suggestions do you have for parents who are trying to encourage their children to laugh at good clean fun and to avoid profane humor just avoid the profane humor but accept as early as you can that as a dad you're just not funny um, and, that, and, and that's going to help you a lot help them avoid the profane encourage them just to have pure things but you yourself i don't know maybe till they're like eight or something you could be funny but after that it'd be okay with not being funny i understand one of the things that we were talking about at break and this really i think is a good place to introduce it in light of this question what about some of the movies and television shows that that are so prevalent in our society today and we as consumers sometimes and as christian consumers we buy in sadly yeah. and, and so what what should our view be our, our policy be i guess as a christian could you ask this question to dad and to mom <laughs> What, what are you watching with your children? Fine, that's a good question. But the next question is this, and it's just as important, and you're, you're lying to yourself if, if you won't answer correctly. What do you watch after you put the kids to bed? Because that's going to affect your children. 
integrity. If you put your kids to bed and then you watch inappropriate things, you laugh at things that you wouldn't want your children to laugh at, you can forget about it. You chalk it up because someday they're going to figure that out or they're going to see you chuckle at something in a moment. If I'm training my heart to love impurity when my children are asleep in their beds, then I'm going to, that's, I'm going to exhibit that. First of all, it's wrong. Second, I'm going to exhibit that before them in their lives. Great points, great points. I think you also, uh, you know, one of the things and, and uh, a lesson, I think, for us all is sometimes we just have to turn it off. We just have to turn it off. You know, right. Sometimes we just let it run and, and run and say, well, I'm, I'm really waiting for the next show to come on, but we just let it run yeah. and run through this one. And yeah, yeah, you know, the which, next one's not better either, you know, but it's... Yeah, you know, I think we have two options. There is an off button. <laughs> And the other option is we can change the channel. Sure. And, and sometimes maybe we fail in that we don't turn it off or we don't change the channel. And, and so as a result of that, we continuously imbibe in what we're seeing and hearing. And before you know it, we are sucked into the world. And, and you, know, you know, John said, love not the world, neither the things which are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's interesting to me that when I look at the Scripture, it's almost as if there is a progression. Because Paul talks about how we're not to be conformed to the world. James in chapter 4 talks about friendship with the world. And typically before you love somebody, you befriend them. You become a friend. And then what happens? You fall in love with the world. And before you know it, you act like the world. You talk like the world. You dress like the world. And so, bottom line, you're in the world. It's just like Psalm 1, the idea of, of standing, walking, and then now sitting yeah. down with uh, yeah. in the seat of the scornful. Uh, as it pertains to the question that, that came in a moment ago, I think it's interesting that, you know, yes, we need to we need to be uh, a people of integrity as well, as, as the point's been well made. We also need to teach our children. You know, there are going to be things that they are going to see. And, and, you know, some of those opportunities, you know, we may not have realized this was this scene was in this movie or TV show. And obviously age matters of the conversation that we're having with our children. But it should be a, an opportunity also then to, to teach children and to help them. Of course, we see it and it goes too far, then we're going to shut it off. But now we need to have a conversation. Why, yeah. did, why did mom and dad shut the TV off? Why did, we, why did we change the channel? Why did we do this? Not just leave it as, well, we just can't watch that. Because I think there's, uh, you know, then it becomes almost almost taboo. And the older they get, as, as they do get older, they, they're going to, well, let's let's go and check that out because mom and dad are not looking. Now we can go check that out. Sure. But if you have that conversation and you're teaching and training your children along the way, as age appropriate as it is, uh, then, then I think that, that they're going to understand and you're going to be able to teach them the difference between good, clean humor and, and funny and, and that which is vulgar and profane and, and sinful. You know, I think what we're talking about tonight could potentially strike a nerve in the hearts and lives of, of just about everybody within the church because we're all faced with this. And when I look at television today, when I was when I was a young fella growing up, television by and large was pretty tame. I mean, I remember my dad loving to watch the Andy Griffith Show, and he loved Barney Fife, and I love Barney Fife. And you think about the evolution of television and the erosion, and we talk about the the influence of of the media and Hollywood. And, and what a tremendous influence they exert on society. And, and really, in a way, television, movies, media are but a reflection of society today. Yes. We, you know, because you look at, the, look at the erosion in our country today. And we talk about as the home goes, so goes the nation. Our nation's in trouble because our homes are in trouble. And some of that is because of what we feed on, what we, you know, what, what we do for entertainment. And, and as a result of that, we, we buy in. Yeah, 
and I've actually, you know, you mentioned that. It's 2018. I've got some statistics here from Joe Wells' book, Game Plan, in which he has a bubble here, and he talks about uh, the progression from 2005 to 2010. So it's come since a long way since then. But even between 2005 to 2010, the use of profanity in primetime broadcasting programming increased 69.3% just in those five years. Um, the greatest increase of, and, and the use of the harshest profanities occurred in the 8 p.m. Eastern time, which is considered the family hour time. Uh, that's when it was mostly increasing. And then, and then the, the biggest one to me was this. In the industry, they have what they consider the worst cuss word out there. That word increased on television between 2005 to 2010 during this time frame, prime time, 2,409 percent from 2005 wow. to 2010. Wow. And so when you consider that and you think about if, if I treated my TV like a man who was visiting my home, at what point would I ask him to leave? Wow. Great point. I, I read statistically a while back a movie that that uh, came out maybe within the last five years. Uh, if I were to call one of the actors' names, everyone would know this person. But they said one explicit word, profane word, was used, if I recall correctly, some four to five hundred times in the movie. And, and, you know, I, I've got, I, I mean, I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on the English language to some extent. And I have dictionaries in my office. To, to me, that shows the ignorance of some of the writers today. And, and, the, and, and the fact that people would buy into that filth. Uh, I can't imagine sitting in a in a in a movie theater with with a woman at my side and listening to that kind of garbage, and yet people don't think anything about it. So, Mike, I've seen a I've seen a leader in the church post on a social media site that he went with people in the church to a movie that has uh, a particular expletive over two hundred times in it. We don't. It, you want to talk about how it's bad, it's bad, and our society's bad. What's really bad and what's absolutely detrimental, we can't change Hollywood, but we can change how we interact with Hollywood. And what's really, really bad is when I, as a Christian, and our young people do it all the time, put out there, I'm watching this show. In their conversations, I'm watching this show. Or especially if we are deacons, elders, ministers, and we're approving of these things by our participation and by going back to social media, by posting, here I am at this movie. Um, we can't do it. No. We can't. Pretty sobering. Yeah. Pretty sobering. What about locker room talk? Mm. I, I know that you know, one of the questions that we have tonight, should there be a difference in the jokes that we tell in mixed company and those we tell, quote unquote, in the locker room? locker room talk as soon as as soon as you put that you know that quote around that phrase uh, to me the kind of talking that's taking place is not good for anyone and so it, it makes no difference who's there mixed company or not at that point when I when I think of locker room talk that that's it to me it goes it's the gutter talk it's it's vulgar it's that those definitions that we laid out a moment ago it's that's that's the very essence of it in those places uh, and and generally has to do with gestures and everything else going on uh, in a locker room and anybody that's ever been in a locker room understands what I'm talking about so I'm sure. you, you know there was a time in our country when <laughs> Men used profanity in many areas, many sectors of society. And, and if a woman came into their presence, they would curtail their profanity or they would say, excuse me, ma'am. But, you know, women today can outcuss men. I mean, there are some women today that are so profane. And, and I'm not trying to... to throw women to the curb. I appreciate women. I especially appreciate godly women. But but I have heard some women that would make a sailor blush in some of the things that they say. And 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 you know when I think about a Christian 
using that kind of language, it's just it, it's it's hard to imagine. Yes, I have a I have a close friend who played for University of Arkansas. He started for the University of Arkansas as a cornerback, um, and he you know he lived in those locker rooms. He was in that locker room, Bobby Petrino, and you hear the stories of the way that the coaches, these guys were supposed to be mentors to them, would speak to them, like and dogs. the kind of language they would use, and um, that they would use, and you think to it and you say locker room talk locker room. i'm all for locker room talk locker room talk should be a bunch of guys who are talking about common goals working together as a team i don't i'm not okay with locker room talk when it's a euphemism for sin, sinful speech i hate that term because it really is just a euphemism what we're talking about when we talk about locker room talk is we're talking about sinful perverted speech cursing and that's wrong no matter if a woman's in the room or not it's it's just wrong to do and and frankly if I'm in a position of authority over a young man, I ought to be. Because those same coaches who will say these perverted things to them in that locker room, they're the same ones who will suspend them when they behave in a perverted way toward a young lady. Right. But how in the world do you expect to pour perversion into their minds, but then expect them in their lives to exhibit a, a righteous uh, living? That's a great, qu great question. Absolutely. Great question. And, and you know, which I think raises an interesting question. As a parent, do you want your child playing for a coach? that has a gutter mouth. I certainly wouldn't. No. Absolutely not. And, and you know, it's interesting because we, we, our boys played baseball early on and I would help coach and, and being around some of the other, and, and the reason that I got into to start helping, you know, another coach was, was so that I, I could kind of help with the calendar of things and when we were playing ball and practicing and, and some of those things. So I got involved in that way. Uh, it was a great outlet for the you know, community as well. But it also put me around other people that I soon realize in the community, you know, here, here's six other teams and the coaches, they don't think the same way. Yeah. And it become, you know, all of a sudden you walk away from the kids and, and you're over here in the corner and there's a, a, a coaches conference, if you will, before we start the season or anything like that. And the, all of a sudden the level of conversation just went in, in, in the gutter. Yeah. You know, it, it, it turned completely off, you know. And I appreciate them not doing that around the kids. Yeah. But I don't want them to do that around me either, yeah. you know, and, and to, to make that you know and, and I, I made clear I said guys I, I can't be around this kind of language you know and I, and I appreciate you walking away from the, the, the young people to, to you know to have this conversation but I don't want to be a part of this conversation at all which which I think raises an interesting <clears throat> question as a Christian how should we act or react when someone who is not a Christian begins to use profanity or let, let's say begins to tell an off-color joke uh, or some profane joke, etc. How should we react to that? You got to protest with your vote. And you talk about it before. You know, you don't have to agree with everything your government do, does, but every so many years, an election comes along and you cast your vote. I think you do the same thing here. God tells a, a dirty joke. Um, you don't laugh. Um, you know, you go to Romans one thirty two. Then that take pleasure in them that do these things. I'm not going to take pleasure in what you're doing. Now, now the thing is, if I'll sit at home tonight and laugh at some perversion on television, I'm being a hypocrite. But if I'm living my life pure and I'm trying to get close to God and I'm trying to keep my mind close to godliness, and so that uh, when you tell this joke, it really is strange to me and it's outside of what I am okay with, and I just don't laugh. And then I'm going to look for an opportunity to discuss it. If you're not a Christian, I'm going to look for an opportunity to tell you, hey, look. You know, I, yeah, I didn't laugh. I'm not trying to be rude to you. I just I don't I don't laugh at that kind of humor uh, because I'm a Christian, and and see if that I can open up a conversation with yeah. them about why that is. Find those opportunities to you know to, to talk about those things. Why why it is that you know I don't want to be around that. Why why I'm not going to, to put up with that around me or my children and, and stuff like that. I think that you you, you look for those opportunities. That's, That's right. And ask yourself why was I there? Yeah. During the, am I there in that conversation just for fun, or is this a work meeting and I had to be there? Right. Because if I'm just there for fun, sure. I probably need to also be careful about where I'm going. Good point. Yeah. Messages now. We Thomas Wimberly, Mike Jester. We're going to take Thank right you for your call earlier this week. Back I am out of town, so call when I return to Atlanta. The remainder Hope that all is well. Program. Hello, my name is Nathan Franson, author of Breaking the Chains. After growing up in the LDS Church, I walked away from it about the age of 20 years old. 
a lot of people have asked me why I decided to leave it, and they're often curious about my reasons. Seldom is anyone let out of a religion without a lot of contemplation. Most of the time, it involves a process based on their own investigation and, and or something that they've heard. It was through my own study and questioning which led to my decision. There were beliefs and doctrines that were taught that caused me to start questioning it and doubting the viability of that of a religion that had basically dictated my whole childhood. I had questions about different subjects that were often answered with either inconclusive or ambiguous replies by my teachers and my bishop. It came to a point where the more I sought clarification, the more disconnected I felt. Breaking the Chains is an autobiography detailing the reasons that I decided I could no longer be a part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It covers a number of their teachings along with the error and discrepancies of each belief. Throughout the book, the Bible is held as the only standard of authority while weighing the evidence. If you are interested in learning about many of the LDS beliefs yourself, this is a good resource to have in your library. Perhaps you know someone or are studying with someone of the LDS persuasion. In either case, I invite you to read Breaking the Chains. It likely will answer questions that you have had about Mormonism. The book is available through my website, www.mormonstudy.net or Azimuth Media. Thank you for your interest in learning about and reaching those who deserve to know the truth. The Gospel Broadcasting Network is proud to bring you GBN Live. To have your questions answered on the program, please call us at 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. Please try to keep your questions relevant to tonight's topic. If you have a different topic that you would like to have discussed on GBN Live, please email your request to Live at gbntv.org, and we will do our best to accommodate your request. Thank you for staying with us. We are going to conclude in just a moment our study tonight. When does humor cross the line into the profane? One of the things that we want to discuss in the final portion of our program tonight has to do with the influence or leavening of our speech and what we say or what we listen to. And, you know, in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, Solomon said, He who walks with wise men will be wise. But a companion of fools will be destroyed. And so when I think about influence, whether for good or bad, a lot of it comes back to who I associate with. And hopefully and preferably, I can be an leavening agent for good, but sometimes I think if we're not careful, we are the, we're the opposite. So, so what about this idea of, of being an influence for good? It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough thing, because the fact of the matter is, if you take this seriously, and you follow God in this, and you take Ephesians uh, 5 to heart, and other passages about this pure speech, the fact of the matter is, people are going to view you as what they might term a prude, or you're just, you know, you're not in touch, and some people even have this concept, and maybe these coaches who talk this way have this concept, and maybe these parents who talk this way, that I've got to get down on their level, I've got to get down where the kids are. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is, what I need to do is not get down on their level. The fact of the matter is, I need to get as, try as hard as I can, um, draw nine to God and he'll draw nine to you. I need to try as hard as I can to get as close as I can to God's level and then exhibit that to them. But the problem is, if the guy next to me is trying to get on their level... And I'm trying to say, let's hold the godly. What's going to be more popular? Well, you know what's going to be more popular because you don't turn on Comedy Central and see men trying to talk as though they're godly. What's going to be more popular is that other thing. And, and the leavening effect can be in a congregation. Yeah. And it can be that all we need, all we need is for this type of speech to be viewed as okay among those among the dads, among the deacons, among the elders, among the ministers. All we need is, is, is some level of that to be okay, and it'll spread and, and, and it'll move because that's the popular thing in the world today. That's where the world's pulling them. Sure. The question is, where am I as a minister of God, as an elder, as a deacon, as a father, as a, as a godly man or woman in this congregation, which way am I pulling the young people as they're coming up through this? You know, if you think about Christianity as a whole, look at the, look at the 
good that it has done wherever it's gone, the gospel. By the same token, our goal ought to be to lift lift people to a higher plane rather than to live on their plane or ultimately to sink down into the mire of sin. Uh, another question's come in. Are we not approving any sin if the church is not willing to talk about it from the pulpit? Make sure I understand the question. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand exactly. Uh, if we're afraid to talk about it, are we therefore approving it? I think is what maybe what they're getting at there. Could be. If I ignore it, if I don't get up and say, people, you can't drink. You can't drink alcohol. And I'm approving it. If I won't preach on it. Which I think begs a great question. Do you do you think that from the pulpit we give enough attention to the tongue? Possibly we don't. You know, there's, um, you know, unless, and a lot of times what we do, and, and I do this as well, you know, we'll teach uh, our Bible classes, we'll teach them, you know, verse by verse or, you know, through a, a passage of Scripture, and we may not cover topically until we come across that verse that, that handles that. If we're in James and we, we're talking about the tongue, then we'll spend time in that, and then we may not cover it again for yeah. quite a while. Uh, and, the, and the same with our preaching, uh, that happens often as well, too. And I, I was just thinking, um, and, and I think I know where she's coming from now, the, the question, but sometimes it's the case, you know, we preach through both topics and expository or textual sermons, and we, we cover a, a variety of things. And over a certain period of time, yes, we are attempting to preach the whole counsel of God yeah. and to, to stand for the whole counsel of God and, and, and to show that, uh, to do so in our preaching. It is tough to cover every topic, yeah, it you is. know, in a, in a given number of Sundays uh, and a given number of Bible classes that we might have opportunity to teach as well. But I think we probably do need to cover it a good bit more because of the things that we've been discussing tonight. It does affect so many people. But in particular with this, where there's a tendency to pretend that the impure thing came from a pure source, in particular with this, and there's some other subjects like this, but we're on this subject, in particular with this subject of the, of the purity of the tongue, I want to see that sermon more than I want to hear it. It's wonderful if you could and, and, and preach it or teach it, but this is something that happens in everyday life. So I need to see it in everyday life. If you want to be effective with young people, uh, Brother Wells in, in this book talks about if you want your young people to be pure, they must not be in environments in which impurity is being spoken on a regular basis. This sermon's got to be seen, and it's got to be seen by men who are genuine godly leaders. So really what we're talking about is the source. I mean, I mean really it all goes back to the source. And, you know, if, 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 if the well is polluted... Then, then we're in trouble. Yeah. We're, we're, we're training the heart. We're, we're right. attempting to reach the heart uh, of man. I would say I'd, I'd add one word to this, this whole conversation, and that's the idea of being consistent. You know, if, if we're going to if we're going to preach this, we need to live this, and 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 living this is preaching that, whether right. it be from the pulpit or, or just, you know. What, what about very before quickly it. before our time's gone? What about yeah. Philippians chapter four, verse eight? <laughs> that. That is key to this, and thinking on things which, when, we, when we're dealing with things which are pure, when we talk about a pure source, pure water, purity, let these things be in your mind. I'll say this, and I think any man who discusses this has to admit, at some point in our lives, we said things that we're not proud of. I know in a particular time in my life, some years ago, in which I said some things that did harm, and I had to make it right with everyone that it did harm to, and, 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 and I think about what I had to do was not say... What I said was so much wrong, but I had to redig my well. And I think that if anything, our message is this. If you're listening to this, and in your life you recognize your speech is wrong, it's not just saying, oh, that thing I said was wrong. It was examine yourself, redig your well, find a pure heart in you, you draw close to God with your heart, and have, and have a pure well. If you take it instance by instance, you'll be dishonest with yourself. Yeah, and, that, and that goes back to even what John the Baptizer was preaching to bring forth fruit to meet for repentance. Yes. You know, where, where does that begin? That doesn't just begin with the action. That begins in the heart that's going to change. And, yeah. so I, and I like the illustration of redigging that well, uh, that pure source. And I think so, so what advice do you have for people? Let, let's say that there are people watching the program tonight, and, and in their heart of hearts they're saying guilty is charged. 
and, and so you know they're thinking I need to make some changes so what what would you what would you suggest Obviously, you know what we're talking about: <clears throat> redigging, redigging that well, and, and going back. And you know, when when we talk about going back, we're talking about going back to Scripture. We're talking about going back to and find that pure source. What is it that God expects of me? What is it that He wants me to do? And examine myself by it. And there may be things that I yet to real have yet to realize that that I have to change or need to change. And that's that's self examination. Second Corinthians thirteen five. That's something that we do. We need to do on a daily basis. And, sure. and, and that passage obviously is talking about whether you even be in the faith, yeah. uh, and I get that context, but that, that point is proven over and over. We, we examine ourselves prior to partaking the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis. So there is that self-examination that we need to do. We go back, and I, and I begin to look, okay, are, are the words that I'm using... Um, are, are they are they coarse words? <laughs> am I using gestures that I should not be using? Am I am I posting things that I shouldn't be posting? Am I uh, you know? And, and I'm, am I putting myself in a place where I'm tempted to do those things also? Because you have to take away the temptation to do those things. And, and so I, I would begin there. And I'm sure yeah, there's others that's, to add to it. Well, that's a very good point. <clears throat> and I would say to get started with that, it is like anything else. Break something. I would that would be my thing. Break something. Sure. Um, if it's a, if it's a video game, if it's a certain movie, if it's a delete some stuff off your phone, delete some stuff off of your off of your account that you have with your movies on it and your TV shows. Um, and, and the big thing is, if you're going to break something, break what's in the way, burn it. Do like they do like jo- King Josiah did. Burn it and throw it and don't throw it to a river, but throw it into a trash can and get rid of it. And th- and and the big big thing is. You've got to humble yourself and let the people around you know I've recognized this in me, and I'm going to I'm going to redig my well. I'm going to I'm going to get a different heart. Yeah, you know I was just thinking about okay, if you let's say you clean house, you move everything out, the bad, you got to fill it with something. Absolutely. And so Philippians four eight. That's it. That's it. Fill it up with good stuff. You know Jesus said, "Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God." And uh, you know, purity of life goes a long way. Uh, and one other thing I wanted to mention very quickly, I know our, our time is almost gone, but we didn't address, and we could have, when we talk about the, the tongue and all the problems associated with that, but, you know, sometimes people get involved in gossip, uh, they malign character, they become what I would call a verbal assassin. And, and, you know, if we're not careful, we can use the tongue to denigrate others, for example, before our children. And then, you know, we set we set a pattern for their behavior later in life as well. And there's a circle of comedy that attempts to do that as well, and yeah. and, and calls it humor. Yeah. And yet, it's it's vulgar. It's not humor. It is. Yeah. And you talk about filling that time. Stop binge watching Family Guy, South Park, whatever other TV show it is you're watching that's bad for you, and uh, start start binge watching GB. Download the GBN app. <laughs> watching this you already watched tv in that's right but there's there's wholesome things you can even stuff that's not religious there's wholesome things that Good you can stuff. spend that time with uh, put the bible in audio on your phone put gospel singing in your car F- fill it with something wholesome. look there are plenty of things to fill up the void absolutely uh, no no question about that uh Matt and Wayne, thank you so much. Thank you appreciate for having us. your words of wisdom. You guys did an outstanding job tonight. I appreciate you being here. And uh, the things that you said, very, very helpful. Biblical, helpful, uh, applicable, and hopefully and prayerfully, we have helped some people. You know, I think sometimes when we engage in a program like this, we forget about, you know, we're trying to help people. And we're trying to help because we all want to go to heaven. Yeah. And that's that's the goal. And so, again, thank you. Hope you'll come back and be with us again very soon. Thank you. Thank you Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate the opportunity to come into your home every week. We thank you. We love you. We hope that you will tune in again next Thursday night. And until then, may the Lord bless and keep you. God bless. This has been GBN Live. Thank you for watching. is Cam-
Cameron Freeman, and we are so glad that you're watching the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Here at GBN, one of our favorite questions to hear is, where is that in the Bible? We want you to know, you always have a right to ask that of any preacher, pastor, or priest. Surely you are aware of the fact this. that we have within this nation and within the world hundreds of religions. Even within Christendom, we have hundreds, perhaps thousands of churches. And yet, whenever we go to the New Testament, we find a single religion and we find a single church. On our program today, we invite you to stay tuned. We're going to examine the subject from the New Testament, the unique church. And nothing but the truth. This is the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Love one another for love is of God. He who loves is born of God. It's nine o'clock. This is WZAYLP, Rockledge, Florida, FM 92.9. It's 53 degrees. What do you think about Jesus of Nazareth? My name is Chris Clevenger, and thank you for joining me today for Thy Word is True. You know, the question I just asked you, what, what do you think about Jesus of Nazareth, is a question that men have been having to answer for thousands of years. And basically, from the time that Jesus walked upon the face of the earth, men had had differing opinions about who Jesus is. And in fact, in Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus asked His disciples a very important question. He said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And then the disciples began to answer and said, Well, some say that you're Elias. Some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus asked this question, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You know, when I ask you the question, Who do you think Jesus of Nazareth is? Then you've got to answer that. When we look at the Gospel of Mark, and we begin reading in Mark chapter 1, we read about the authority of Jesus, His preaching and His power. When we read Mark chapter 2 and chapter 3, we read about the way that Jesus interacted with the Pharisees and with the scribes. When we read Mark chapter 4 and chapter 5, we read about a lot of the miracles that Jesus did and the perception of the people in regards to those miracles. But now as we approach Mark chapter 6, where we're going to center our thoughts during this period of study together, Mark gives for us here some popular opinions about Jesus of Nazareth. And basically, Mark, in Mark chapter 6, takes a poll of those who have been in contact with Jesus up until this point in time and asks them, who do you think Jesus is? And what do you think of Jesus of Nazareth? Is He the Christ? Is He the Son of God? Is He someone else? Well, there are eight different ideas. There are eight different thoughts. There are eight different people uh, that think something about Jesus. Some of them are right, and some of them are very, very wrong. But we're going to go down through the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, and we're going to notice these eight different ideas about who Jesus is. And you'd be surprised to find out how many people today fit into one of these eight different ideas about Jesus of Nazareth. So let's begin in Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And let's lay the foundation here. Jesus has been preaching in and around the area of Galilee, and now at this point in time, He goes back to the city of Nazareth where He was reared. And many times we say that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that He was reared in Nazareth, and that He made Capernaum His home, and He did. But Jesus goes back, Mark chapter 6 and verse 1, into His own country, the city of Nazareth, and He goes in on the Sabbath day into the synagogue, and He begins to preach. Now, the reactions of the people to the preaching of Jesus, they're not exactly what we would expect. In Mark chapter 1, when we look at someone preaching about Jesus, teaching about Jesus and His Word, Jesus goes into the synagogue, He teaches, and they're amazed at the authority that He has. He teaches as one as authority and not as the scribes. Evidently, Jesus was teaching the same thing here in Nazareth. Evidently, Jesus was teaching with the same authority here in Nazareth. But in chapter 6, beginning with verse 3, here's what happens. 
The Bible says that these people who heard Jesus said, From whence hath these men these things? And what wisdom is this, which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? And they said, Where did this wisdom come from? Where did this power come from? Now verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. You see, here's the first mentality about who Jesus was. And they thought Jesus was just a carpenter from Nazareth. They looked at Jesus and they could essentially say, this Jesus, he's lived here his whole life. We've seen him from the time of his childhood. We've seen him grow from his youth. And he's a carpenter. His mother is Mary. His brethren are here, James and Joseph. Even his sisters are here. We know who he is. We know his parents. We know his family. And this is just the Nazarene carpenter. And that's the way they looked at Jesus. Essentially, they consider Jesus just another man. And the Bible says there at the end of verse 3, they were offended at him. Now watch what happens in verse 4. Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And the Bible says, verse 5, He could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He had been teaching and preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. He had been teaching and preaching and proving by his works that he was the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. But these people, instead of believing in Jesus, the text tells us, verse 6, they didn't believe in Jesus. And in fact, according to verse 3, they were offended. They stumbled at him. They considered Jesus just another man. Let me ask you this. Are there people in today's society who consider Jesus just another man? In fact, there are. You know, when we look at it historically, it's almost impossible to deny that a man named Jesus lived in the city of Nazareth and was crucified in the city of Jerusalem. Now, historians, those outside the body of Christ, they doubt that Jesus of Nazareth was actually resurrected from the dead, that he was the Christ, that he was the Son of God. But you can't deny the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. They'll say he was just a man. He wasn't the Son of God. He wasn't the Christ. He wasn't the Messiah. He was just a man. There are people today who look at Jesus the way that these Nazarenes did, and they say, well, there's nothing special about Jesus. He was a good man. He was a good teacher. But in the end result, he was just a man. But we know that's not true. As we keep reading here in the Gospel of Christ, we've already seen that the first mentality toward Jesus was that he was a Nazarene carpenter. Now, the second mentality seen towards Jesus is one that represented him as Master and Lord. And we see this possessed not by the Nazarenes, but by the disciples, the apostles of Jesus. If we continue reading in Mark chapter 6, and we begin with verse 7, the Bible says, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. This is what we call the limited commission. We read about the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, where Jesus sent his disciples in all the world. Now here in the limited commission, he's not sending the apostles in all the world. He's sending them only to the Jewish nation, to the Jewish people in Galilee and in Judea in the south. And so these people who are being sent forth, these apostles, are commanded by Jesus. Watch what he says there in verse 8. Verse 8 says, Jesus commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey except a staff only. Don't take scrip or bread and no money in your purse, but be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. And he tells them, I want you to go and I want you to preach. I want you to go and I want you to heal, and then I want you to come back again. But the interesting point is the fact that Jesus, verse 8, commanded them. Only a Lord, only a Master has the power and the authority to command others what to do. And these apostles recognized that in Jesus. Now, if we flip over one page to Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 32, we read about them coming back from this. Verse 30, the Bible says, The apostles gathered themselves together again unto Jesus and told him all the things, both what they had done and what they had taught, all the miracles that they had wrought, and then the message that they had taught as well. In verse 31, Jesus says, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure to eat. Jesus commanded them, verse 8. Jesus, in verse 31, he told them to go apart in a desert place and rest for a little while. You see, he was their master, and he was their Lord. 
For some people in the world today, they recognize Jesus as more than just a mere man. He's the master. He's the Lord. He has the authority, the ability to tell you and I what to do. Uh, we are creatures. He's the creator. He's the redeemer of all mankind. And Jesus would later say in John chapter 14 and verse 15, the night of his betrayal, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he said, John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do the things that I command you to do. We've got to obey the truth through the Spirit, an unfeigned love of the brethren. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Jesus, as our Lord, has the authority to tell us what to do. And so Christians view Jesus as master and as Lord. So the first mentality of the Nazarenes was Jesus was just another man, just a Nazarene carpenter. The second mentality was possessed by the apostles where they said, Jesus, he's master and he's Lord. But the third mentality towards Jesus is very interesting because there's at least one man who thought that Jesus was the resurrected John. When we pick up reading together in John chapter 6, verse 14, the Bible says this, And King Herod heard of him, he heard of Jesus, for his name had spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. He heard about the preaching and the teaching of Jesus, but specifically Herod heard about the miracles of Jesus, and he said, you know what, this has to be John the Baptist who is risen from the dead. Now the backlog on Herod is something that Mark bears out as we continue reading Mark chapter 6, verses 16 and following. John the Baptist came unto Herod, and he preached against some activities that he was involved in. Specifically, he had taken his brother's wife. The brother's wife's name was Herodias. He had taken her and married her for himself. And so Jesus, excuse me, so John was apprehended by Herod because he was preaching against this relationship that Herod had with Herodias, one that was ungodly, one that wasn't righteous, one that was sinful. And so John was apprehended and cast into prison. Now, while John was in prison, the daughter of Herodias came and danced before Herod, and she pleased him. And Herod made the promise to the daughter of Herodias and said, I'll give you whatever you ask up to half of my kingdom. As she consorted with her mother, and Herodias said, I want you to ask for the head of John the Baptist on a charger. Herod didn't want to do it. He feared because he knew that John the Baptist was a just man and a holy man. Yet for the oath's sake, he beheaded John and brought the head unto this woman. You see, what caused Herod to believe that Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, was actually the resurrected John the Baptist, was really sin and guilt. Because of his own guilt, because of his own shame, and because of his own sin, he really misconstrued and had a misconception about who Jesus was. He thought that Jesus was simply John the Baptist resurrected from the dead. Now, if we put this in a contemporary setting, there are times where men and women, because of sin, because of shame, or because of guilt, they don't really see and understand who God is, and they don't really see and understand who Jesus is. Let me put it to you this way. Have you ever heard of someone saying, well, Jesus can't save me. I've sinned too much, or I've done too much, or, uh, or I'm too far gone. You see, they don't understand who Jesus really is. And they may not think that he's a resurrected John the Baptist, they may recognize him as the apostles did, as Master and Lord, but they don't see his ability to save them from sin. And that's because of their guilt, their shame, and their sin. You see, when we allow sin and guilt and shame to creep into our lives, it hinders us from seeing Jesus for who he really is in all of his majesty. And so you've got the Nazarenes who saw Jesus simply as a carpenter. And there are people today who view Jesus as simply just another man. You've got the apostles of Jesus who viewed him as master and Lord. And there are people today, faithful people, who view Jesus in that way. And then you've got Herod who viewed Jesus as the resurrected John because of his sin, shame, and guilt. And there are people today who don't understand the particulars about who Jesus is because of the same causes. Now, number four. And not only do you see these things laid out, but when you look at John chapter 6, verse 15, you see that there was a group of contemporaries with Herod that didn't think he was John the Baptist, but they didn't know that he was Jesus the Christ. In Mark chapter 6, and verse 15, you have a group of people who think that Jesus is simply a resurrected prophet. Read it with me. Mark 6, verse 15, the Bible says, Others said, This is Elijah. And others said that it is a prophet 
or as one of the prophets. Now we can read through that and not catch what they say here. The Bible says that these men compared him to or said, maybe this is the resurrected Elijah. He wasn't. Uh, John the Baptist really fit that bill, not because he was the resurrected Elijah, but because he came in the spirit of Elijah. But they also said of Jesus at the end of verse 15, it's very interesting, they said, or maybe he's as or like one of the prophets. Did you catch what they did? They took Jesus, the Son of God, and said, he, he's a little bit better than a mere man. He, he's not simply just another man. They looked at Jesus and they said, we're not sure if he's master and Lord, and he, he's certainly not the resurrected John, but maybe he's just like one of the other prophets. They compared Jesus to just another prophet. Are there men and women in the world today who view what the Bible says about Jesus and then will respond, well, he was just another prophet of God? Like Moses, Elias, Jeremiah, Jesus was just another prophet in a long line of prophets that's continued on down through this day. In fact, there's a religion in the world that a large part of the world's population believe in and follow that teaches Jesus was a good man, but he was simply another prophet. And that God has sent subsequent prophets who are higher and more noble and better and should be followed above Jesus. There are people today who are trying to compare Jesus to other historical figures or other prophets. The fact of the matter is this, Jesus can't be compared to others. Jesus, when you lay him alongside any other man, any prophet, anyone else, they won't measure up. And Jesus can't be compared to other prophets. He reigns supreme above all of them. He's certainly not Elijah. He's certainly not Jeremiah. And he's not one of the other or as another prophet. There's nobody else like him. But there are people today who claim that he is. So all of these mentalities about Jesus... Maybe he's just a carpenter. Maybe he's the resurrected John the Baptist. Maybe he's like one of the other prophets. Maybe he's the master and Lord. And we keep reading more and more and more. But when we come over to Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 33, there are two groups of people who view Jesus in differing ways. The first group of people, those who are righteous and those who are good and those who see the facts laid out before them, say, well, Jesus is that prophet. He's that prophet. In Mark chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus has brought his disciples into a wilderness place. And the Bible says, The people saw them departing, and many knew him, and they ran afoot thither out of all the cities. And they outwent them and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people. He's moved with compassion because they were like sheep, but they didn't have a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. He taught them. And as the day wears on, he recognizes that these people have no food to eat. And Jesus asked, where are we going to get food to feed all of these? And, of course, you know the context here. There are 5,000 men plus men, women and children. He causes them to sit down. And there's a young lad who has five barley loaves and two fish. Jesus takes the five loaves and divides it among his apostles after he blesses it, and they disperse to the people. Jesus takes the two fish, he blesses it, he breaks it, and his disciples disperse it. And so now you have 5,000 men plus women and children who are partaking of five barley loaves and two fishes. And Jesus had the ability to multiply this food miraculously. Now after the meal was concluded, they took up from the fragments that were left over 12 baskets full, just enough for the apostles. Jesus had provided not only for the 5,000 plus men, women, and children, but for his own disciples. He provided for them. There was a group of people there as we continue reading here in chapter 6, verses 33 through 44. And in verse 41, the Bible says, when he had taken the five loaves and two fishes, he looked up to heaven, he blessed and he broke the loaves. He gave to his disciples and set before them. The two fishes divided he among them all. They did all eat and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. We don't read the reactions of these two groups to the miracle of Jesus. So leave your finger here in Mark chapter 6 and go to John chapter 6. Because the same miracle is written about in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 6, if we read together what the Bible says in verse 14, you have the reaction of one group of people. The people who were taught, the people who were spiritually inclined, they say this about Jesus. Then those men, when they had seen this miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Did you catch it? 
said, this is of a truth, certainly this is, truly this is, that prophet which should come into the world. Now, all the way back in the, in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15, when you read the book of Deuteronomy, you see that Moses prophesied that there's going to be a prophet like unto himself who God is going to raise up out of the children of Israel, and the children of Israel should hearken to that man in all things. That prophet was Jesus. And the people there, Deuteronomy, or excuse me, John chapter 6, verse 14, they recognized that. They saw the miracle of Jesus, and they said, Jesus is that prophet. Now, here's what they did. These people who saw the miracle of Jesus, who said he's that prophet, they had the ability, based upon their study of the Word of God, to take what Jesus said and what Jesus did, to view it as the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures, and to recognize him for who he really is. The people today have the ability to read and study their Bible and then come to the conclusion that Jesus is that prophet. He's the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. He's the fulfillment of Genesis 12, 1 through 3. He's the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies from his birthplace to his death to the types of attitudes, the mentalities, the things that he would teach, all the particulars about his ministry and his life. They view Jesus as the fulfillment of all of those prophecies. Their study leads them to the result that Jesus is the Christ. He's that prophet. Yeah, there are people in the world today who do that. There are people in the world today who are willing to honestly study God's Word and are convinced that Jesus is that prophet. But like I said, there's a second group of people who are written about here in Mark chapter 6 and John chapter 6 who weren't so impressed with Jesus of Nazareth. And this group of people, if I'm going to put it in a way that we can readily understand, and this group of people view Jesus simply as a free meal ticket. One group of people viewing the gospel here in Mark chapter 6, verses 33, and in John chapter 6, they saw the miracles that he did and said, truly, this is that prophet which should come into the world. Now, there's another group of people written back here in John chapter 6, verse number 24. Jesus, after he feeds the 5,000, he departs to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and many follow him there. Now, the Bible says here in John chapter 6, verse number 24, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping, and they came to Capernaum. They were seeking Jesus. Verse 25, When they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? They knew that Jesus had the ability to feed them. He had just done it. 5,000 men plus women and children. Now watch what Jesus says. Verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Jesus said, You didn't seek me for my teaching. You didn't seek me because of my miracles. You're actually some of the ones who are seeking me because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And then he continues and he says, Don't labor for the meat that perisheth, but for the meat that endures an everlasting life. And then three times in John chapter 6, he says, I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. He says, What you're looking for is a free meal ticket. And that's all that you see me as. But I'm so much more than that. I can give you life. I can give you freedom. I can give you redemption. But they view Jesus as just another meal ticket. You know, some people do look at the Bible. They study the Word of God, and they see Jesus as that prophet. And yes, others view Jesus, sadly, as just a free meal ticket. The ability to come together and, and to benefit from the financial contributions and the blessings and the generosity of other people. Now, some people view Christianity for what they can get out of it and not for what they can put into it. And they view Jesus as a free meal ticket. So looking at Mark chapter 6, you've got a group of people, the Nazarenes, who said Jesus is just another man. There are people today who view Jesus the same way. He's just another man. He historically existed, but he's not the Son of God. And then there are other groups of people who view Jesus as Master and Lord, and those typically are Christians who recognize that he has the ability and the authority to tell us what to do. And then there are others, like Herod, who thought Jesus was John the Baptist, who are confused because of their sin, their shame, and their guilt, and they're deluded. They don't really see who Jesus is. 
But then there are others who think Jesus is simply like one of the prophets. He's just a prophet in a long line of prophets, and there were superior prophets who came after him, and there's nothing further from the truth. In fact, that's blasphemy. Then you have these two groups of people here in Mark chapter 6, 33 through 44. One group who were fed and said, this is that prophet, the fulfillment of Old Testament text. Another group of people who said, this is the man who can give us all that we ever desire as far as physical food is concerned. But as we keep reading here in Mark chapter 6, we arrive at verse 45. And when we read verses 45 through 52, we find a group of people who recognize that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Son of God. As we pick up reading in verse 45 of Mark chapter 6, the Bible says, Straightway he constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to sail before him unto Bethesda, Bethsaida. And so Jesus sends his disciples, his apostles ahead on the Sea of Galilee. He remains behind, he goes up into a mountain, and he prays. And the Bible says in verse number 47, When even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he, Jesus, was alone on the land. He saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night. So Jesus is on the shore. He looks out on the Sea of Galilee. He sees the disciples, and they're struggling in the wind and the waves. And the Bible says in the fourth watch of the night. The first watch was from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The second watch was from 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. The third watch was from 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. And the fourth watch between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Jesus sees them in the fourth watch of the night, sometime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. And the Bible tells us He goes unto them, walking on the surface of the water. And we pick up reading together. The Bible tells us that when they saw Jesus, they were afraid and they said, It's a ghost. But Jesus said, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. He entered into the ship. The wind ceased, and immediately they were on the other shore wherever they were going. Now that's the Gospel of Mark. But when we take what they say here in verse 51, the Bible says, When he went unto them into the ship, the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and they wondered. When we take the Bible and we go to Matthew chapter 14, 22 and 23, we read the same account. And these disciples, instead of being speechless as they were in verse 51, they respond and they say, Truly, this is the Son of God. Based upon the miracles that He did, based upon the message that He preached, based upon everything they knew about Jesus, His ability to, to work the wind and the waves and to do what He did, truly this was the Son of God. Do some people today recognize Jesus as the Son of God, who He really is? Absolutely. There are people in the world today who recognize Jesus as the Son of God. You know, there's one more group of people here in Mark chapter 6, verses 53 through 56. And this is a group of people who saw Jesus as Savior. When Jesus arrives in Bethesda, he goes into the land of Gennesaret. He drew to the shore, and when they were come out of the ship, the Bible says straightway the people knew him. And that's interesting. He gets out on the shore of Gennesaret, and immediately the people know who he is. Now watch what they do. Verse 55, they ran through the whole region round about. They got those who were sick, they carried them on beds, and they heard where he was. Verse 56 says, And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or countries, they laid the sick in the streets, and they besought him that he might touch them, or if the border of the garment would be touched, they would be made whole. All the sick from Gennesaret, all the sick from Bethsaida, all the sick from the region, when they heard that Jesus was there, they recognized him as Savior, and they went to be cleansed. One of the greatest needs of these people on this occasion was the redemption that they had from sin and their cleansing of these types of abnormalities and sicknesses. You know, today there are people who recognize Jesus as Savior. They recognize not just that He brings physical healing and physical strength, but that Jesus is the Son of God, is the only one who can save us from our sins. Make no mistakes. Some thought Jesus was just a man. Some thought he was the risen John the Baptist or one of the prophets. Others thought he was a free meal ticket. But we know based upon the gospel of Christ that Jesus is Master and Lord, that he's that prophet, that he's the Son of God, and that he's the Savior of the world. 
Don't ever let popular opinion change your mind about Jesus, the Son of God. Hello, I'm Jim Dearman. If you have questions about something you hear on GBN Radio, why not give us a call at 662-874-5508 or send us an email at info at gbntv.org. That's I-N-F-O at gbntv.org. Zion's glorious psalm is stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They him their king in strange divine. I heard the song and strove to join. I heard the song and strove to join. Sing Simply put, motives matter. Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin. I thank you for tuning in and being with me here today for another edition of Searching the Scriptures. As you can guess from my opening statement, I want us to talk about motives. And particularly, I want us to talk about the motivation for us to do what we do as the children of God. But before we get into that, let me say more about the fact that motives matter. Your Bible and mine, it teaches that we can be doing the right things, but be doing those things for the wrong reasons. And if that's the case, in God's eyes, we are still unacceptable. Now, if we were to pause and to let that sink in, that should be a very sobering reality for us. It should caution us to be careful not just to go through the motions, not just to be doing what we know to be the right things, but also to be engaging and monitoring our hearts, making sure that we're doing the right things for the right reasons. Now, that is the will of God, and thus that should be our goal as we live the Christian life. All of this being said, I've entitled our study today simply, The Motivation to Serve. The Motivation to Serve. Now, we know that the Scriptures teach that as Christians, we are actually servants. We are not only servants of the Most High God and obviously servants of our Lord Jesus Christ, but in these capacities of necessity, we are also servants one to another and even servants to our fellow man, even those alien sinners who are yet outside of the body of Christ. Now, I want you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Galatians, and as you're opening there to chapter 5, you might want to place a ribbon or a bookmark at this chapter because so many of the verses that we'll be reading together today come from Galatians chapter 5. Let's begin with our major text, verse 13. Here we read, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love. Now that indicates a motive. But by love serve one another. Now you can clearly see probably from this verse the reason for our title, the motivation to serve. And equally clearly is the fact that the motivation should be love. We should love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And loving God in that way will also necessitate loving our neighbor, that is, our fellow man, even as ourselves. That's the motivation. Why do we do what we do? Why are we careful to live holy lives? Why are we careful to serve the needs of others? Why are we careful to make sure that self is in the back seat and not in first place? Why? Well, namely, because of love. Our love for God and our love for fellow man. Now, I want to share with you something interesting that for many, many years I did not realize, but only recently I have come across this. The word love itself is only used three times 
in the entire Galatian epistle. Only three times. But even more interestingly is this fact. All three occurrences are found in chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is where we read about love these three times. I want you to keep that in mind as we know, notice today that love is the motivation to serve. We love God and we love one another, therefore we serve. Keep that in mind as we develop three major points undergirding, if you will, this idea. Point number one, I want us to see in the first place the instruction to service. The instruction to service. Now, what I mean by this point simply is God teaches you and me to serve and to do that by Music or through but love. Airplane mode. We're clearly Switch taught cellular that data. Wi in the Bluetooth scriptures. Audio. Now, if you're in Galatians 5, audio and I hope you have Switch your Bible button. open on. there presently, Double tap let's go to show first more to verse 18. Tap the setting. Here, Actions verse available. 18 tells us the following. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So many today speak of being led by the Holy Spirit. And much of what's being said along those lines is very, very mystical and even in some senses would be miraculous if it were accurate and if it were true. But the reality is that many people who claim to be led by the Spirit they don't even understand what they are saying. And in actuality, when you compare their lives and their doctrines with the Bible, you immediately realize that they are indeed not led by the Holy Spirit of God. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? Well, that's a good question. The Holy Spirit has provided for us the Scriptures, the Word of God. And today, you and I are led by the Spirit if and when we are living our lives in accordance with the Spirit's revelation, namely, the Scriptures. Consider this with me in light of what we read in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Notice here what the Bible says. This, there is, therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, notice their manner of life is not according or after the flesh, but after the Spirit, that is, after His teachings. Notice verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Here in Romans 8 and verse 2, we see that the Spirit is connected with a law. Namely, the Holy Spirit has revealed unto man a law. Now, in this, the Christian age, that law is the New Testament or the gospel of Jesus Christ. Though it is the gospel or the good news of Christ, we read from passages such as John 16, 13, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13, and many others, that the Holy Spirit was the agent employed in the furnishing and in the revealing of that law, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if one is led by the Spirit, that is, he or she is led by His law. They are following the revelation that the Spirit has provided and that the Spirit has revealed. Now we return back to the book of Galatians, this time to chapter 6, and we see something more said about that law. Look at Galatians 6 and verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens. Now obviously that would be an act of love and an act of service. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now friends and viewers, I hope as we notice all of these verses, one after the other, that the big picture is becoming clear. Jesus Christ has furnished us with a law, namely the gospel. He did so through the agency of the Holy Spirit who inspired the apostles and the New Testament prophets in giving us this law, the, the New Testament of our Lord. Now, as we live according to that and are led according to these teachings, 
We are to bear one another's burdens. As we bear one another's burdens, or we might say serve one another in love, we're fulfilling the law of Christ. Friends, that's this first point. The instruction to service. God teaches you and me to serve one another and to serve our fellow man through love or out of love, if you will. Let's go now to James chapter 1 and consider verse 25. Here the Bible says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. We read that the Spirit has furnished us a law. We know that it is the law of Christ. James here described it as the law of liberty or the perfect law of liberty. But even further, what did James tell you and me to do? He told us to look into that perfect law and to continue therein. Obviously meaning to practice it. Make application of the Spirit's teachings in our very lives. And as we do this, as we are doers of the work, James assures us that we will be blessed by God indeed. The instruction to service is followed, of course, by blessing. And that should be something in which all of us are interested, being blessed and being accepted of God. And so as we talk about the motivation to serve, let it be noted, of course, that that motivation fundamentally is love. Let it be noted further that God has instructed us to serve out of love. He's taught us through His Word this very principle or concept. And we'll wrap up this first point by reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Here the Bible says, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. And so clearly it is God's will that we serve out of love, and the Bible teaches us this. The Scriptures provide such instruction. But now, let's move on. We're continuing to talk about the motivation to serve. It must be love if it's the proper motivation. But in the second place now, as we develop these thoughts, I want us to see the selection of service. The selection of service. Now, at first hand, you might hear that point, and you might think we're going to talk about our being able to select what we'll do and how we'll serve. But that's really not the idea. If you think about a servant or a slave, they are not able to pick and choose which aspects of their master's will they will perform and which other aspects they will refuse or neglect. That's not the case with a servant or a slave. But rather, a servant or a slave is expected and even bound to obey at all times and in all things. And that is really the reality with our relationship before God. As His children, we are not to select, or as we say, pick and choose what we will obey and what we will refuse. But rather, we are simply selecting to obey God, period. Now, I've chosen this because love is a choice. You and I have to choose to love. We must select to love God and to keep His commandments, as we read, of course, in John chapter 14. Now that being said, let's go back to the book of Galatians and namely go back with me to chapter 5, our major text. And beginning at verse 13 again, we're going to notice that love is a selection. Love is a choice that you and I make. And that's going to be brought out from these and other verses. Verse 13 begins this text. 
For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Notice that was a command. But by love serve one another. Verse 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 15, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. As we read these three verses, we see that love is commanded and the appropriate actions or service that should come out of love, they're really commanded. And so the really, or actually the only selection for you and me is whether or not we're going to obey. Am I going to love? That's my choice. Am I going to serve out of that love? Again, that's my choice. Now, in verse 15, such a choice as that was contrasted with another choice, and that is to bite and to devour one another. That is, to be at odds with one another and to be antagonistic to each other instead of serving one another in love as brothers and sisters. Now, which of these choices, for example, are you going to select? Which one am I going to select. And of course the Bible teaches the selection of service. Now friends, I know that in our day and time love is often presented as an emotion. And true enough, there is an emotional side to love in various aspects. But biblically speaking, as God commands you and He commands me to love one another, and thereby to serve one another also, we see that love is not merely an emotion. In fact, it is not so much an emotion as it is a decision or a selection. Now God help us to always make the proper selection and not to be guilty of what we read about in Galatians 5, the last verse of that chapter, verse 26. Look there with me at this time. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Do you see how that's the exact opposite of serving one another in love? Now, if one were to select that in verse 26, they would be at odds with God. They would be found in rebellion and in uh, stubborn disobedience to His will. The selection is yours. Which will you choose? And we are always to choose love and service and not uh, provocation, not envy, not biting or devouring one another. Now let's stay in Galatians 5. Back up with me as we read verses 16 and 17 together. Notice what these verses teach. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You know, these two verses bring out, I think, very vividly for us the fact that the Christian life is a series of choices. In fact, it is repeated on a daily basis you and I, our being confronted with choices to make. Paul said there in verse 16, walk after the Spirit or in the Spirit's will. We've already noted that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us the Scriptures, the Word of God. Now, will you select the Scriptures? Will you select God's way and walk, that is, live customarily in that will or in that pattern? Or are we going to walk according to the flesh? Fleshly and carnal tendencies, inclinations in us as human beings that need to be curbed, need to be monitored and guarded very, uh, very cautiously, if you will. Paul tells us don't live that way. Don't, don't give in to those things, those fleshly things, but rather walk and live a spiritual life. A life that is devoted to service, yes, and that service 
out of love. One more passage here in Galatians 5. Move down with me to verses 24 and 25. Here we read the following. And they that are Christ's, if indeed you and I belong to the Lord, we have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, if indeed, let us also walk in the Spirit. And so here in Galatians chapter 5, we see again the selection of service. What will you select? What will you choose? Now, as we wrap up this second point, I want us to go outside of Galatians momentarily. I want us to go to a rather familiar passage recorded concerning our Lord and His words found in Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 23. Notice how Jesus described this choice before each of us. Verse 23 says, And He said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now that's a selection. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, and we might add, in his service, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away. Luke 9, 23 through 25. And so it is as we discuss love as the motivation to serve. Number one, the instruction to service. We are instructed by God to do so. Number two then, we've talked about the selection of service. And that is you and I have to choose love. We have to choose to serve one another and to serve God. But now point number three, as we wrap up this study together today, I want us to note the production of service. The production of service. And by this point, what we're going to see is that love itself is a produce or a production of the Holy Spirit in our lives working through the Word of God, obviously. Notice this with me, first of all, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Notice the first item. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, as we read the fruit of the Spirit here, the idea has to be that if the Holy Spirit is permitted to exert His influence in and through our lives by means of the Word of God, well then these, these qualities found in those verses will be the natural produce. They will be the natural production in our lives. And the one that heads the list is love. Now, let's couple that with what we read earlier in this chapter, Galatians 5, verses 6 and 7. Notice, verse 6 says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Verse 7, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Now, from these two verses, there are a number of observations that would merit our attention. First of all, back up in verse 6, notice that under this, the Christian age, it is not circumcision, fleshly circumcision, that is the salient test of whether or not we're in covenant relationship with God. But rather, he said, it is faith which works by love, Galatians 5 and verse 6. In other words, we believe in and we trust in God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and thus, in obedience to them, our faith works, and the motivation behind such works is love. And so we see that yet a second time in Galatians chapter 5. But that being said, are we going to continue in that life. See, we move now to verse 7. 
And in verse 7, he told the Galatians, ye did run well. In other words, initially you obeyed the gospel, and for a span at least, your faith worked through love. But now who has hindered you, Paul asked, that ye should not obey the truth? And so secondly, another uh, key observation would be this. Love which serves has to continue. We cannot love and serve for a little while and then as if to say we're finished, our duty is fulfilled, and we can go on back to selfishness. We can go, divert back to worldliness or unfaithfulness. Paul here is rebuking the Galatians uh, for that very thing. He says you were running well, but now someone has hindered you. Who has hindered you that ye should not continue is the idea to obey the truth. And so the production of love is something that has to be ongoing. It has to continue. Now look with me into chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. Here near the close of the epistle, Paul wrote these very words. He said in verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. We learn an interesting lesson here from this parallel. In Galatians 5 and verse 6, we read about circumcision and the fact that it has no religious bearing today whatsoever. Paul says, what matters is faith which worketh by love. In Galatians 6.15, though, he again points out that circumcision is not a religious consideration today. And he goes on to say, but a new creature is. And so by way of parallelism, we see that being a new creature in Christ inheres a faith which works by love. And so our production of service our serving man, our serving God, and the production that comes out of that, that is a sign that we are new creatures in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Galatians 6, 15 and 16. Now, as our time is fleeting, I want us to make practical application of this point. The production of service. Number one, what does that mean? It means that we need to be producing in benevolence. Look with me to 1 John chapter 3, and let's read together verses 17 and 18. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And so number one, we need to be benevolent people, concerned about people's needs and even their earthly needs. But now number two, the production of service should also mean that we're concerned about their spiritual needs and that we're evangelistic in our efforts. Look with me quickly to 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19. Here we read from the Bible, For though I be free from all men, Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. The truth, and nothing but the truth. This is the Gospel Broadcasting Network. And now, something to think about with Dan Manuel. Someone said to handle yourself, use your head. But to handle others, always use your heart. And isn't that a worthy thought? It is, isn't it? Let me ask you a question. When you deal with other people, do you use your head intellectually or do you use your loving heart? 
You know, I'm thankful that God had both. But I'm really more especially thankful that God had a loving heart. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have life everlasting. John 3 and verse 16. You see, God uses His heart to reach out to us. Why not use your heart today to reach out to others? And that's something, something to think about. Bluetooth, N Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Air Media, Preview, Play, Next, Lock, Screen, Bright, Volume, Do Not, Access, Living Room, Living Room, Music, Selected, Screen Recording.